Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everybody. In our podcast episode today, we talk about the solstice. This is one of those strange and amazing astronomical events. We have the longest night of the year, and at this particular moment, there is a return of the solar forces. Cultures from the beginning of time have noted this particular moment. Psychologically, we discuss how to rest into the wintering process when our life force goes down under the ground. What are the different solstice traditions, some of the myths of the return of light, and perhaps most importantly, the pregnant darkness of the long night? After that, we interpret an interesting dream about the survival of the inner feminine in the face of intense aggression. So we're glad to have you here, and we look forward to talking with you. Well, it seems to me, and I think to the three of us, that the obvious overt meaning of solstice, which has been celebrated for eons by cultures all around the world, is the theme of the return of the light. And uh, so it seems very obvious and yet somehow mysterious about what is the big deal about the return of the light. And, and I guess just to sort of put this out at the beginning, we are obviously thinking about the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> okay. Our listeners in Australia and elsewhere uh, down there and in, uh, in, in South America will be experiencing something very different this time of year. They'll experience the return of the light six months from now. But um, our frame of reference, of course, is the Northern Hemisphere. So. So um, I thought, let's just think about what the solstice is um, astronomically. Um, so the Earth um, orbits around the sun, and the solstice occurs twice a year, and it's marked by the longest and shortest days of the year. And this happens because the Earth's axis is tilted as it moves around the sun. So this occurs when one of the Earth's poles as its maximum tilt towards the sun, and this happens around June 21st uh, and December 21st, at least in the Northern Hemisphere where we are. So, because of this particular tilt, we have, as is going to happen shortly for us, the shortest day of the year. And I think in all cultures, um, recorded history has given us a sense of this, that the shortening of the days and the lengthening of the nights carries this um, kind of spectacular psychological process. And there is a great uh, projection that human beings have made upon the great lengthening of the night, which uh, since ancient times has been also the most dangerous part of, of, of our time. That as human beings, we are more vulnerable at night. Um, we don't see at night. We can't defend ourselves at night. We can't predict what's going to happen you know, in the pitch black night. And so, understandably, there's an enormous feeling about that. Yeah. There's an inherent human fear of the dark. Mm -hmm. 
Joseph, you said it was a projection, and I, I get what you're saying, but I think also, as as we're all saying, it's not just a projection. It is a sort of very embodied primordial experience uh -huh. of of a kind of death and it's the lengthening of the night and 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 that it gets colder and the growing cycle shuts down and animals hibernate so it's it's really it's really a kind of embodied experience i think even as yeah. moderns we we are not in touch with that as much uh but but even so, I think there's an echo of it in our bodies. I mean, uh, you know, I think seasonal affective disorder is a is a echo of that, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely. And kids are afraid of the dark. Uh, you know, I know uh, my oldest first grandchild would not go down into the basement. Uh, when we lived in a brownstone in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And this is a full basement. That's where my office was. <laughs> it was not some sort of uh, dank uh, place with spider webs. But it was oh, beautiful. No. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> but she would not go she would not go down there. And uh, I think the dark psychologically is such a great representation of the unconscious. It's it's deep and it's vast and it's embodied and uh, it's what we don't know. And we, we have good reason, I think, from an evolutionary perspective to fear all kinds of things happening in the dark, that there are predators in the dark. Uh, and, and so it is, as you were saying, Lisa, it's deeply instinctual. And these are the dark days. These are the dark days of the year when we sink into the unconscious and who knows what can happen in the unconscious. This I is also, it's, I'm just thinking that um, bat, not that far back, th these were also called the famine months. Uh, because the harvest had long since been harvested. Uh, so you're running out of fresh food. A, a lot of the animals would be slaughtered, so there was meat for the winter. And some, no doubt, were preserved so that they could reproduce. But uh, it was a difficult time of the year, and sometimes people starved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can remember... Um, in college as a young adult, you know, this is, this is, this is a tough time of year. If you're a college student, at least for me, it was because, you know, it's dark, it's cold. And of course it's exam time. So <laughs> stress is really high mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's, it's these, these winter exams, not the, you know, at least the summer ones, you, you're sort of like, you know, there's a sense of combination or you're going to have a summer afterwards, but no, this is just, this is just really hard. And I, I would, I would get, it happened several years in a row where I would get very low and then I'd suddenly realize, oh my God, it's, you know, December 20th or it's December 21st. And I would note that my, my very low mood coincided with the darkest day of the year or thereabouts, you know, mm. close enough. So I think, I think we, our bodies know. Oh, Yes. I think our bodies know, too. I mean, we've spent, I don't know how many millennia, uh, living in nature and close to nature. And it's hard for us in modern times with high-rise buildings and electricity and all kinds of things to remember how deeply embedded in the calendar year and in nature's cycles we really are. And you referenced seasonal affective disorder. And part of me really wonders if you know, we have given something a negative label uh, that is also very deeply embedded in us, uh, that we have a body cycle that tends to slow down. We want to sleep more. We make more melatonin when the days get dark. 
Uh, and, and of course, it can plunge some people in, into a terrible depressive state. But we still live according to nature's rhythms and timing, even though we tend to forget it. And interestingly, the idea that there's more melatonin that's produced is that melatonin suppresses sexual androgens. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it prevents animals in the woods from breeding uh, or giving birth you know, during a time of the year that's um, very, very difficult to survive and food sources are very low. So that shift of um, testosterone and estrogen also has an enormous effect on people's moods, their energy levels, etc. So I think as you're saying, this um, response that our brains have to the amount of light that we see suggests that we are so profoundly attuned to the lengths of the days and the nights and how it affects us so deeply. And there's a way in which uh, our whole survival physically and psychically has something to do with this idea of how much light and how much darkness there is. From that standpoint, you know, with the approach of winter, we know that, uh, at least in harsher climates in the north, that the life retreats from above the earth and it goes down into the roots. And this is part of also the Persephone and Demeter cycle. At Demer, that Persephone who is associated with spring and flowering and fruiting is drawn down into the earth and that there is a secret life that is occurring underneath the earth. Demeter is grieving and so, you know, the plants go into stasis and animals hibernate and food. As you were saying, Deb, it's the famine time. Uh, the abundance is less. But I think the Persephone myth is letting us know that in the underworld there is this enormous churning life that is occurring. In the Eleusinian mysteries, this was a very, very important part of that religious process of going under the earth as a kind of death and uh, coming back up to the to uh, daylight as a part of rebirth. And the Persephone myth, I, I believe, was uh, part of the mythology of the Eleusinian mysteries. So what does, uh, what does that mean psychologically? If we were to, to rest into the wintering process, and what might that look like for each of us? I really like that phrase, rest into the wintering. And uh, for me, it's evocative of, uh, you know, can we use it for rest intentionally, a slowing down, uh, self-reflection, quietude, and, and gestation? Um, you know, ev even though this wasn't a time for animals to regenerate, uh, something clearly happened for Persephone when she was in the underworld. She went down as a maiden, and she came out as queen of the underworld. So uh, how do we rest into this time of year and use it to become more, use it for some kind of inner growth rather than a barren and difficult time. It can be barren, difficult, and uh, fuel for growth all at the same time. Well, Deb, your, your uh, reference to gestation brings up another <laughs> image for me, and that is the image of the bear. Now, I might get some of this wrong, so if there's any bear biologists listening, you can write in and correct me. But I believe that bears birth their cubs maybe toward the end of their hibernation. So they emerge in the spring with these new cubs. And that's, that's part of why they, they that, that was part of their kind of mythological significance, is that they, they, they go into hibernation in a kind of, in a sort of death-like state but emerge with new life. And, and I think that speaks to what 
you were saying, and I, I you know, so so this is very uh, unusual for us to think about. How can I turn toward the darkness? How can I use the darkness as a place for gestation and renewal and find that life in the roots that you talked about, Joseph? Which, in some sense, you know, um, getting a um, some special light and sitting underneath it for 20 minutes a day. I mean, if it helps, that's great. On a symbolic level, that's kind of an image of a manic defense, right? And I'm not suggesting to anyone who finds that helpful not to do it, but that we're going to artificially impose light where there isn't any and force ourselves to uh, operate as if rather than honoring the natural cycles and using it as a time to maybe inhabit a low place and see what there might be for us there. You know, there there is wisdom in um there is wisdom in darkness. There is wisdom sometimes in depression. One of the great uh, benefits I think of the wintering is spending more time paying attention to our dreams. Uh, <laughs> That just quite literally, we're yeah. not outside, we're not mowing the lawn, you know, we're not doing a lot of the outdoor sports we might have done um, during the spring, the summer, and the fall. So there's this retreat towards the hearth fire, there's a retreat towards the sleeping, and being liberated from a lot of the summer outdoor expansive dynamics. You know, this is a time to linger in bed for 20 more minutes and try to remember the dream or to have a little more time to jot it down or ponder it. Um, and, and I associate that very much with hibernating. I have to say that I've, ever since I was a kid, I, I found the whole, whole thing of bears hibernating astounding. Okay. I mean, just that, like, they're, um, their their bodies recycle their water like their kidneys create this this ouroboric cycle where their fluids uh, move um, in and out and they uh, they don't need to eat they're barely awake uh, mother bears give birth when they're hibernating they're yeah they're really almost asleep when it happens and then the babies okay. kind of uh, crawl up and start suckling I mean it's um, it's it's an astounding thing. But when I imagine the um, the hibernating mother giving birth and suckling to the cubs under the ground, mm -hmm. it, it gives us this extraordinary image of new life. Yeah, that, that the, is emerging and being nurtured. Yeah, mm -hmm. that the life the life force is underground. But it is darn active. It, it might be yes. sleepy. It might be subtle, but there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, some dreaming, of this journaling, is, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, some of this is reminding me of Stan Marlin's book, The Black Sun, The Alchemy oh. and Art of Darkness. So, uh, you know, this idea of a kind of pregnant darkness that's fertile. But, you know, it's not, it's not uh, jubilant, it's dark and it's heavy but there's something fertile in it yeah but that's the mystery um i'm linking this with um a persephone myth that you mentioned joseph and with bears of, uh, of the mystery of how life uh generates in the dark, in the womb, in a bear, in the underground, where uh, we don't know and we can't see, and yet something moves us to create new life, literally, in the case of bears, and psychologically, in the case of us, uh, that the underground and the dark days represent the unconscious versus ego and solar 
sun, mm -hmm. light, mm -hmm. spring, mm -hmm. activity. <laughs> and uh, understandably enough, we like that. Uh, and yet half our time, more or less, is more dark than light. Must be useful somehow. And, and you had mentioned melatonin. It's very interesting. Melatonin is uh, generated in the pineal gland. And the huh. pineal gland is the gland in the center of the head that is associated with this tracking of the light. It's also associated in many yogic traditions with enlightenment. Mm. Light, enlightenment that these subtle changes in the pineal gland as a result of meditative practices and yoga actually changes how the brain functions so that we can become aware of altered states of consciousness that are particularly associated with spirituality and a kind of spirituality that grants an experience of the unity of all life which is such an interesting irony that we associate the wintering with the withdrawal of life. Mm -hmm. And yet, melatonin and dreaming and these altered states give us an opportunity to expand beyond our limits. And so, in the darkness, and in the privacy of the darkness, that we can grant ourselves permission to at least conceptually move beyond our current limits. And that has something to do with that shift out of ego consciousness, because it's the ego that says, here's the schedule. We're up at 7, we're at work by 8.30, I'm coming home, and then I've got this to do, and this to do, and this to do, and he's there, bop, 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 bop. And, and in the wintering, when certain things are taken off our plate, um, or at least it might have been when we were an agrarian culture, you know, working mm -hmm. in the fields, mm -hmm. there is this opportunity to expand in the inner world which in many ways is far, far broader than what our waking consciousness would have thought. Mm -hmm. So that time of um, poetry and even religious feeling. Mm -hmm. So um, around the solstice, we also have to talk about the idea of the birth of the, the great saviors. Yes. Mm. So... Um, of course, you know, the birth of Jesus happening right around this time, which, which makes sense that in the darkest yep. uh, metaphysical time of, of the human soul, that there needs to be this enormous response, spiritual response, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that uh, there is something in the human soul that can stand against the darkness and do not be consumed by it. And this goes to the ambivalence about the unconscious, that if the ego is intact, much like Persephone, we can go into the underworld and return with a sense of potency and maturity. But if the ego is immature and we become engulfed by the unconscious, then we are subject to savagery and chaos and, and impulses that can be rem remarkably destructive and self-destructive. So it's not a sure bet to be, to be swimming around in the unconscious. No, it's not. So I think in the Christian mythos, you know, Christ being born here right at the solstice is this hope that consciousness can stand against these destructive unconscious impulses, that there is a new civility, there is a birth of, of mercy. Mm -hmm. which is a uniquely human trait because it is a decision to stand against our purely instinctive survival impulses and to consider something that the environment itself might not suggest, that mercy is a transcendent consideration. Mm -hmm. And so we have the idea of redemption. And to be redeemed is an intervention, a restoration from 
beyond that purely instinctive realm yeah. Yeah. into a philosophic consideration. Hi, I'm going to take just a minute to remind you to uh, like us on Apple Podcasts, uh, subscribe on YouTube. It really helps us build an audience. It's a great way to support the show, and we appreciate that. You can become our patron by going to our website, and thisunionlife.com, and then click on podcast, and you'll see a link there to our Patreon. You get bonus content every week, including little mini episodes and dream interpretations, and you can submit your dream. And finally, I want to let you know again about Dream School. This is the month to do it. You can get 10% off by using the code HOLIDAY2023. That's HOLIDAY with a capital H. And we now have a way to gift a membership. There's a special gift membership. So if you haven't gotten that special someone a present yet for the holiday, uh, your subscription to Dream School is just the thing. So head on over to our website, thisunionlife.com, and sign up. I'm thinking about how incredibly reassuring it is uh, that that restoration is promised. Mm-hmm. That at the you know at the darkest hour there's a dawn uh, to invoke some old trope, even if I'm uh, paraphrasing it. That the light, th- that there is light in the dark, uh, and that that's a promise. I I also like very much uh, you you referencing that ego has to be able to stand and hold its own uh, against the dark, mm-hmm. but. Uh, it, to have a separate space to be able to stay intact, mm-hmm. not not to fight it, uh, but to somehow use it, to somehow maintain its own integrity. And uh, I have often wondered, you know, what was it that Persephone did all day while she was down there in the mm-hmm. underworld? <laughs> you know, the first she had to sort of survive the trauma of her terrible abduction by Hades. But then she was down there for different myths, give different timelines, but let's say four or five months. And did she wander around in the tunnels? Did she meet the wise man Tiresias and have conversations with him? What kinds of treasures did she discover? But something happened that when she emerged, she was queen of the underworld and she had incredible magical powers and, and and i think it's a wonderful image of um how the darkness and the gleam of light of the solstice of it just turning into slightly more light uh can be inspirational and can help us us uh, stand separate, differentiated, and conscious in the face of darkness. So, leaning into the Persephone myth a little bit, is one of the things that happens to Persephone is that she discovers her fertility. Um, We know that when she was in the underworld that um, Hades gave her some pomegranate seeds to eat. And any of us that have cut into a pomegranate, I mean, what happens is that the blood red juice Mm -hmm. begins to flow. So to eat the pomegranate is also for her transition to move um, out of the child, the core, into fertility. Uh, Freud called that prepubescent stage latency. So it's in the mystery of the darkness that we move from being um, childlike into being fertile. And of course, that changes her status, that she is no longer the little, the little, little child of Demeter, but that mm-hmm. she is a fertile human soul. And so it, often it is in the darkness that we discover that we are fertile, mm-hmm. that there are things that we can give birth to, like the bear, or that Persephone, there is a mensus cycle that begins in her own fertility and the power of being fertile is restored to her, or granted to her, rather, in the darkness. 
Well, and the the kind of clim- climax of the Eleusinian mysteries, apparently, I mean, we don't really know because the secrets were well guarded, but it was, you know, that Persephone would appear and uh, she would have become a mother. Mm-hmm. So I think there was a, a, a cry like, Brimo has become Bri- Bri- Brimos or something like that. And um, so... That goes exactly to what you're saying that, you know, while Persephone was hibernating down there, she became generative. And that that was the transformation that happened. So she returns, but she she's different. It's not a restoration of what was there prior. There's been mm-hmm. there's been some change. Yeah. Development. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I believe in like the um one of the myths that she is pregnant with Dionysus. She is one of the Yep. The mothers of Dionysus. Um, so, again, all of this extraordinary secrets that happen in the dark. The other myth that I think is relevant is the myth of Isis and Osiris. Mm-hmm. That um, So, um, Isis and Osiris are really the, the daytime gods and goddesses. They, are, uh, they teach winemaking and... Uh, the harvesting and the cultivation of wheat and and culture and, and beauty and all of these kinds of products of ego um, innovation. Seth or Set, who is the envious brother of Osiris, who is associated with the darkness, mm-hmm. with the solstice, and with the underworld, grabs hold of Osiris and chops him into pieces and scatters him all around. And so there is this intractable, intractable problem that all of this luminous potential is now lost. And Isis decides that the one who can solve the problem is the sun, Ra. Mm. Mm-hmm. But she has to trick Ra into giving her the secret of resurrection because the sun would seem to set in the west, travel yes. in some magical way through the darkness, and be reborn in the east. And so she sets a serpent into the path. And so when Ra passes, the serpent bites him, and he becomes deathly ill. And Isis <laughs> happens along and says, Well, you know, I do have a cure for this uh, uh, viper that's bitten you, but you know, in order for me to want to give that to you, you have to give me the secret secret of your true name. Mm. Because if you have the true name of something, then you have all of the secrets and power of the one who has given you the name. Sarah hems and haws, but eventually says, ah, okay, here's my secret name. And then having the secret name, she then has the secret of resurrection, which she then uses to resurrect Osiris, but he is resurrected in the underworld. And he is sewn together. She is impregnated by him. But in the outer world of daylight, he is a mummy. Mm-hmm. But in the mm-hmm. underworld, he is brilliant green. And the green is associated with having come full of life. So he rules over the living and the dead, and he judges the dead as to their fitness to go into everlasting life. Mm -hmm. We may recognize that theme in other religions, by the way, so interestingly. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful, Joseph. Yeah. Hey, you know, talking about how these themes recur, one of the things that strikes me about solstice celebrations the world over is how many of them uh, have a th- have light as their theme. Of course, you know, mm-hmm. Christmas time we associate with you know candles and fireplaces and Christmas lights, and it's fun to drive around and see how you know what decorations, what lights, uh, light displays. We go we go to light displays, and there's a really beautiful one at Longwood Gardens, not too far from me. And uh, you know, Christmas is a lot about light, and of course. Hanukkah has a very different origin story, but 
the important imagery uh, or some of the important imagery is the menorah and the lighting of the candles and the feast of um, Santa Lucia in, in um, Scandinavia, which uh, was originally, um, uh, you know, pagan. It was associated with Norse traditions. I mean, the, the, the classic thing, and they actually still do this at, at a Swedish church here in Philadelphia. They, um, the girls actually will <laughs> wear lit candles on their heads. I've I've wow. been to the service here. Oh, how there are people along the aisles with buckets of water. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that sounds really a, pra but, um, a practical matter. <laughs> yes, but how beautiful! But, uh, also, it's extraordinary. It is, it is. It is very beautiful. So. Uh, um, but, but in, in, in the Norse times, um, the, the, uh, the, the, there would be lighting of fires to ward off spirits during the dark nights. And, um, uh, you know, Yalda is a Mitha Mithraic solstice tradition that still, uh, is practiced in Iran. And it was the birth of the sun god Mithra also. And uh, it was seen as the victory of the light over the dark. So just again and again and again, um, there are images of light this time of year. And I, I think it goes to, we were talking about how embodied this experience is of solstice. It's also, so it's instinctual. And of course, it's also archetypal. And the the archetype of the return of the light or the, the, the resurrection, if you will, or the rebirth, whether it's, um, Mithra or Persephone or, um, uh, you know, Christ, that something gets reborn this time of year. And, you know, I can, again, I can feel it. I, I, I have a sense of relief on December 21st because what I know is that December 22nd is going to be a little <laughs> bit longer. Mm -hmm. And I can, I yeah. can sort of feel that in my body. So what I'm thinking about is the uh, Jungian term, one of the first um, mysterious ones I came across, of <laughs> anachiodromia. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when I first uh, started in a Jungian seminar about 150 years ago, uh, I came across this word and... Uh, I remember I was so enthusiastic, and I s somehow had some other question for the seminar leader. Um, and I said, do you know what this word means? And he said, yes. <laughs> 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 but it's such a great word. And uh, as I understand it, it's not the swinging of the pendulum. You know, that the pendulum swings one way and then da -da, the compensatory force will be, it swings back the other way. But it is what we're talking about, that the mystery is that somehow the opposite is born. Mm -hmm. so, so that in the darkness, yeah, that's, that's the darkness okay. itself uh, gives way, gestates, yields to, creates... It's opposite. And I, I think that's embedded in a lot of what we've been talking about, that, you know, how did Persephone become queen of the underworld? You know, that there is the mystery of gestation, whether it's uh, bears or, you know, the birth of the magical uh, savior child at this time of year. Uh, and that's that's the joy, I think, in the promise, is mm -hmm. that 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 light will be born of the dark. Mm -hmm. And part of the good cheer of, of this time um, is also captured in the Saturnalia of, of the Roman yes. world. Yes. That um, uh, for all the, the bad press that Saturn gets for other reasons, apparently when Saturn yeah. ruled the ancient world, it was the golden time of humanity that it was the best time, that the most prosperous time culturally uh -huh. in terms of resources. And then yeah. Jupiter overthrew Saturn and all this, all this turbulence started happening. But the Saturnalia um, has to do with the harvest. And, and in mm -hmm. you know, December, really, there still are food stocks 
um, the fields have finally been um, claimed, all of the fruits, all of the pumpkins and squash and everything else, and there's still meat in the larder. And uh, during the Saturnalia, there is this great celebration of the abundance of fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, people would uh, walk along the streets and they would shout, Sigillaria, which <laughs> is um, basically Merry Christmas, mm -hmm. um, uh, good abundance. This, this mm -hmm. is the golden moment where we get to cease the outer work and feast and, and trust in the goodness of the gods. So that and wonderful greening, yes. uh, good cheer that we associate with, uh, with the solstice kind of, and Christmas. Thinking of the ghost of Christmas present. And, uh, yes, and, uh, Santa Claus, the, um, who is another yes. Saturnalia. Yes. You know. and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in those times, um, the drinking and feasting was you know, a time of the, the famine months you would compensate by drinking and gambling and carousing and, and you know, uh, having abundance uh, until there, there would be gift giving and all kinds of things. And uh, then the Protestant Reformation happened. Oops. <laughs> All the dour contraction. And then it yeah. became, uh, uh, they tried to change it into a religious uh, holiday, a more sober and solemn one. And uh, Charles Dickens, you just referenced a Christmas carol, yeah, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he, his effort was to make it a family holiday. So... Mm -hmm. so so to preserve the the joyfulness of it, without going into the Saturnalia of uh, mm -hmm. Roman it's times and beyond. Right. But it does yeah. sound like fun, doesn't it? I mean, we still yeah. there's been definite yeah. revival of that in modern times. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we also need to um, think about the myth of Attis and Cabell, in as much as. Cabell is the ancient, ancient, ancient uh, earth goddess, uh, pre-Greek, pre-Roman. She gives birth to, as often happens, her son, who becomes her first high priest, and her lover as well, the gods often fertilizing each other. Um, Attis, you know, gets into this uh, enormous conflict of whether he should serve the goddess or fall in love with one of the one of the village girls, this intractable problem he cannot solve. He rushes into the forest and castrates himself. And as he is bleeding to death, his blood strikes the ground and the ground um, erupts in violence. Hebel senses that something tragic has happened and rushes to him and to save his life turns him into the first evergreen tree. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so the solstice is also the time of the harvesting of the evergreen tree. They would entomb the tree, dress it like Attis, and then bring it from the earth mm -hmm. in the spring. But evergreen trees for um, Attis and ivy for Dionysus, because as anybody mm. knows, if you've got English ivy growing in your yard, it never goes away. You can mow it down, <laughs> you can spray Roundup on it, you can pull it out, and the next, you turn around and the ivy's grown out of the ground again. Uh, but it is this irrepressible evergreen life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the winter and the solstice and the darkness cannot destroy. Mm -hmm. So the evergreen foliage, the rising of the sun, uh, the fertilizing energy of the dark, the birth of the bears, the pregnancy of Persephone, uh, all of the life in Hades. Um, mm -hmm. I, it's I the didn't promise know of continued life. Yes. yes. Yeah. I didn't know that that had been born of the legend of Addison Cabell. Uh, but uh, funny, I, I came across Pine Tree also as the symbol of long life and immortality and constantly, constancy, 
courage and steadfastness, which takes me back to what you were saying earlier about ego's ability to stand against, stand in the darkness uh, with that evergreen uh, of the pine tree, uh, that we can be there. And, and of course, the Puritans, I mean, they were, in the 1840s, this was a a real no-no that uh, Christmas was sacred and we're we're not doing this Christmas tree thing, Um, which Mm -hmm. fortunately... Uh, has, but you see, but there it is the power of the symbol, even if you don't know the story. That's right. You know, you know, you want a pine tree, you know, you want the lights, you want that tree. Uh, yeah, there's something about that, that the tree with the lights on it, right? I mean, I know it it speaks to us again at the, the level of the archetype, and so even if you, you know, many people who are not of the Christian tradition or, you know, I mean, you know, we, 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 we appreciate the symbolism of that. I think no matter what tradition we're from. Yeah. Remind me here. um, Jung has a, um, a wonderful story. I think it comes from a dream where he realized that he is holding this tiny candle of consciousness in the dark. Yeah. Yes. Remind me, yeah. where does he say that? That's in Memories, Dreams, Reflections. I'm, I'm is that from certain. a dream that he had? It is. He had a dream that he was holding a little candle um, in, a, in a storm, and he had to cup his hand around it to protect the light. And um, I can probably find it pretty quickly if you like. I'll look. That would be, be great if we can find that. But uh, mm-hmm. that that is Jung's solstice. Um, mm-hmm. Yes. The little Whatever. light of ego that is able to stand against uh, the great darkness. Uh, and that the whole great venture of Jungian analysis and Jungian work is to kindle our flame higher against the darkness. To be able to stand in the vast unconscious to stand against our complexes and the confusion of the darkness to stand against our nightmares the misfortunes that we have and to trust that being conscious or kindling consciousness in the face of these um, unpredictable unconscious forces is a path it is a way to be And that to extinguish the light is to extinguish consciousness. And so much of our venture here, as we move towards the end of another year of our podcast, Mm -hmm. the great venture of of our work at this Jungian life is to do what small part we can to kindle consciousness, to recommend that book, to encourage people to Mm -hmm. look at their dreams or interpret a dream and hope that some little bit of light is useful to the person who submitted their dream or for people to join us in dream school and to meet with other people and to kindle their light in the midst of of the darkness. And that the darkness helps us kindle our light. That's the generative power of dreams, which we're forever talking about. That psyche and the darkness, the unconscious, is generative. Would you like to hear the dream? Uh, Yes, let's do it. Okay. So I believe that this was um, during his student years. So it may have been uh, when he was at university. Um, About this time, I had a dream which both frightened and encouraged me. It was night in some unknown place, and I was making slow and painful headway against a mighty wind. Dense fog was flying along everywhere. I had my hands cupped around a tiny light which threatened to go out at any moment. Everything depended on my keeping this little light alive. Suddenly, I had the feeling that something was coming up behind me. I looked back and saw a gigantic black figure following me. But at the same moment, I was conscious, in spite of my terror, that I must keep my little light going through night and wind, regardless of all dangers. 
When I awoke, I realized at once that the figure was a specter of the Brocken, my own shadow on the swirling mists, brought into being by the little light I was carrying. I knew, too, that this little light was my consciousness, the only light I have. My own understanding is the sole treasure I possess, and the greatest, though infinitely small and fragile in comparison with the powers of darkness, it is still a light, my only light. Oh, oh. <laughs> and that's memories, dreams, and reflections. So, so what a discovery to be granted in a dream, mm -hmm. that even though the light of, of our consciousness may seem small as we stand against all the mighty and terrible storms that are in the world at this moment, collectively, geopolitically, perhaps moving in our own personal lives, but that tending our own consciousness is a response even to the great storms that are happening in the world, much of which Jung attributed to human beings not being adequately conscious mm -hmm. and subjecting themselves to these collective thought groups, submitting to propaganda, and, and yielding into the homogenizing um, diminishment of consciousness. And, and that's the, the other side of, of the darkness, is that in the darkness, you cannot distinguish the difference between things. Mm -hmm. You can't tell if something is blue or green or yellow or orange. You can't see, um, perhaps depending on how dark it is, you can't see at all that we're kind of groping and maybe can get a vague sense of how things feel. When consciousness is diminished, God forbid extinguished, mm. we are much more vulnerable to illusion, to, to untruths, to being manipulated by strange algorithms and social media, mm -hmm. to be saturated by propaganda, etc., and etc. That it's the light of consciousness that allows us to discern one thing from another and to walk with safety in the darkness, even if the safety is only a small circle of light that's just mm -hmm. a foot in front of us. Mm -hmm. But at least for that foot, you can see what's around you. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about your phrase, the um, homogenization of, of consciousness. Uh, for, you know, and how we turn some of these amazing images, like Jung's dream, that uh, I'm so glad you could find it so fast, Lisa. Mm -hmm. But we, we turn it into a little trope, you know, of this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, mm -hmm. f f we're, f which is wonderful and it's dear. But um, I'm picking up on your point, Joseph. Of it is crucially important that each one of us find our inner light of consciousness and protect it and grow it and mm -hmm. stand in the darkness with it because change is not going to come from any place except within us first. Mm -hmm. And so it may seem like, oh, gee whiz, you know, what can I do about, you know, all kinds of difficulties in family, community, uh, the, the world at large. Uh, that dream of Jung's says it beautifully is, mm -hmm. you know, protect and guard your light and, and it will let you see and sense your shadow behind you. And that's meaningful. That matters. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. And that the light had to be shielded. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That our consciousness is vulnerable. Yes. That we cannot watch terrible images on the news for eight hours mm -hmm. and expect our nervous system to be just fine about it, mm -hmm. uh, to listen to the propaganda of whatever agency, news agencies we submit to hour after hour after hour and expect mm -hmm. our tiny little light of consciousness to withstand the barrage of material that we're given or that is 
blown upon us like a great wind. Mm. Mm-hmm. Instead of the small insights that come from within us, but what do you think? Not, not, not what, what some news commentator thinks, but what do, you, what do you think? What do you perceive? Mm-hmm. What, what do you sense is important? Do you feel it is important for you it, it, in this enormous world where millions of things are happening all the time? And which brings us back to the, the wonderful gift of the solstice where there is a contraction. Mm-hmm. That one of the gifts of the cold is that it contracts things, it expands mm-hmm. things. So as, you know, it's 35 degrees outside and it's, right now it's uh, cloudy and it's kind of silvery and I don't really want to yeah. go outside and mess with the yard. Yeah. And, you know, I want to overeat is really what I want to do, actually, but uh, <laughs> stuff my face yes, with there's fudge, that. That is, not a contra- <laughs> that is not a contraction. <laughs> Absolutely. That's that is my an expansion. Bear. <laughs> That's an expansion. Like, that's a Jupiterian expansion of that. Santa always has a big belly for a reason. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but we do. There, uh, there's a contraction. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, whether it's a contraction where we're shielding that little light of mm-hmm. consciousness, but this contraction inside ourselves, and and that dropping into the rhizome is is consciousness. Yeah, that's curious about the rhizome, and the rhizome is that place from which we. Uh, emerge as our authentic self and as i think dev you've talked before about you know uh, uh, inside an acorn is an oak tree and inside that oak tree which is yet to sprout is an acorn yeah which mm-hmm. and inside of that acorn is an oak tree that yeah. it's it's only through our retreat to the rhizome that we can rediscover the natural matrix that we are mm. And so all of the conditions of our lives that cause us to retreat down below the earth also gives us an opportunity to shed the luxuriant bullshit that has grown (laughs) out of us. You know, all of the leaves, the decorations, the fruiting, the the bizarre affectations, the clothing and fashion and money and possessions Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the beginning of the wintering that all that falls off the tree. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I'm aware that as we have uh, talked about the solstice, uh, that there is um, in me, and I think among us, but, you know, you, you tell me, a, a spirit of real joy, of reassurance, mm-hmm. And uh, sort of an everlasting, uh, this, this is the great cycle. We're part yes. of it. Yes. It, and uh, it has ever been and it ever will be. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I want to, you know, sort of say, ah, whatever your tradition is, you know, good tidings, happy yes, holidays. Yes, we wish you, we wish you the good light solstice. Is re- <laughs> the, yes. the light will return. <laughs> Sigillaria! (laughs) (laughs) And so, let's transition to a dream. Our dreamer today is a 75-year-old male who is a teacher. And this is his dream. I take my cat Charles, a black and white Sox cat, to someone's apartment, a place I thought was safe. But the person's dog walks forward and bites into Charles's face and just holds on. When it lets go, Charles runs away. I find him, and he's alive, but his face is terribly disfigured. I take him home, while my wife, understandably, is quite upset to see him. And he writes that uh, the significant context is 
Charles was my best friend in a certain community where I lived for five years in the early 90s. He loved me unconditionally. He disappeared way back then. I'm not aware of any big transitions currently. My wife and I have come a long way together in the 20 years of our marriage and are generally doing well these days. He says his main feelings were really just horror to witness his violence and then the damage that it appears will be lasting and looks rather grotesque. And for associations, he says, Charles, the cat, is like my heart almost, so deep and dear. No personal associations with the dog. My wife is sensitive to the visually grotesque in real life. You know... <clears throat> This seems to me a whole subcategory of dreams, which is kind of what I'm going to say, like a wounded or lost animal dreams. It's not uncommon to have these dreams. I've certainly had them. I've worked with lots of people who've had them. We get dreams like this on the podcast. And I, I think it always shows some way that we're not um, sort of tending to ourself well enough. There's some tender a soulful aspect of ourself perhaps that's been um that that we've been remiss we haven't we haven't cared for ourselves well enough so one of the things that um comes up for me about this dream is um first of all i wish we knew something about this place the dreamer says i take him to this place that i think is safe but the dreamer has made a miscalculation and so i'd be really curious about what this place is, you know, are there any associations to this place? Is there anything you can think about this place? Does it remind you of anything? Who are the people there? You know, just really search for any uh, more information about the place that might help you understand what that place is symbolically that you've taken this cat to. And the other thing I'll say on, on this theme is, um, the dreamer mentions that, you know, Charles was like his heart. And I've had a cat like that. I've had a soulmate cat. And boy, that is a really special relationship. And I'm I'm struck that the dreamer says, um, you know, and, and it, it would be interesting to go back and look at this community where he lived in the 90s with Charles. But I, I was struck by the fact that Charles disappeared. Because if you have a cat like that, um, my guess is that if the cat disappears, that there's a tremendous sense of guilt that you somehow failed the cat, that you let it escape and get away and maybe some ill fate befell it. So that seems related to me, perhaps, to uh, this this idea that somehow he he hasn't he hasn't made the best choice when taking care of the the, the Charles the cat part of himself. I'm curious, um, in the significant context about the dream where he writes, Charles was my best friend in a certain community, um, I was assuming that that was a human Charles. That just the name Charles was um, uh, something he was associating uh, to the cat. Did, am I understanding that no, correctly? Or no, do you think the Charles... title of the dream is Charles the Cat. Okay. So huh. I, I think Charles Charles was his best friend who loved him unconditionally. Okay. All right. That's that that's my assumption. Well, my the first thing that strikes me is most people don't take their cats around to other people's homes. Um, that that in and of itself is an unusual thing. I, I can't imagine anyone who's ever um called me up and said, hey, listen, um, I know we're coming over for dinner. Mind if I bring my cat? <laughs> um, I have on rare occasions said, do you mind if I bring my dog? Yeah. But cats are so independent that it's so rare well, to have to travel like with your car, cat. And they don't like new places. Mm -hmm. and you're right. Yes, yes. Well, they can run why is he and... bringing the cat somewhere? It's a great question. Yes, it's a very, it's a very unusual, unusual thing to do. So... As you said, the, the great flaw is that he thought this person's apartment was safe. And then, you know, this, this sad thing happens. What it makes me think of is that some of us 
often, if we've had a difficult childhood, develop a promiscuous trust. Mm-hmm. And you see this in, in children who have been mistreated in one way or another, that as adults, that they will be overly trusting or make overly trusting assumptions. So he brings something that to me seems rather soulful, you know, his best friend cat. And he brings it to a place that he's not really uh, sure. He's decided it's safe, but it's someone's apartment or other, and it's not. So some people who are very, very sensitive and, again, have promiscuous trust will often come into the analysis and frequently say, once again, you know, I met with, you know, my friend and I disclosed, you know, one thing or another, and then they were said something biting to me, or they said something cruel, or they mistreated the information or mistreated my feelings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then the person feels resentful or betrayed or hurt. But the dream is suggesting, well, why are you bringing a cat? You know, why are you bringing your soul around to environments or introducing it to people that are vulnerable or or that make you vulnerable to getting bitten in a certain way. I think that um, there are certain typologies that are a little bit more vulnerable to this. Introverted feeling types have a tendency to, to show up and disclose really intimate material, soulfully important material, and underappreciate how sensitive they are to having that mistreated. Mm-hmm. You know, I also wonder about the dog, because on the face of it, no pun intended, this is a terrible <laughs> thing that's happened. But um and and there and there is a feeling of horror, but but I am just curious about what happens if we lean into the possibility that the dog is somehow the medicine in the dream. That okay. the dog's ability to be um aggressive where the cat is all soul, you know, is that, is that somehow an undeveloped part of the dreamer or a part of himself that he doesn't have a a good relationship with? Um, You know, so where is that? Where is that in, I'd be curious where the dog part is in the marriage, for example, you know, Mm -hmm. there's this kind of shrinking away from feeling of horror on the one hand, but uh, but a, a marriage needs both the tender cat part and the um, aggressive dog part too. So, so say more about how um, the dreamer might work with that. Well, I guess I guess I would say, you know, this this a, a little bit falls into the category of something we talk about a lot that, you know, the least trustworthy attitude is out of the dream ego. Mm-hmm. So the dream ego and his wife are horrified. But is it possible to imagine? I mean, I would just sort of try it on as a hypothesis. Is it is it possible to imagine that somehow um this was uh was necessary in some way? You know, was it mm-hmm. or or helpful or what is what was you know? I might ask, what was the dog responding to? Was what, you know, was the dog just trying to protect the house? And again, mm-hmm. it would be helpful if we knew more about the house or the person that it belonged to. But but um, and then I I think I would also wonder like I, I if the if this were my dream, I might ask myself, so where is my kind of dog like aggression? Uh, which I think relates to what you're saying, Joseph, because if this is a person who's kind of overly trusting. Um, you know, sometimes that, that kind of tracks with not having good access to your healthy, aggressive instincts. So, you know, where, where is my dog part? Um, you know, is my dog part kind of turned inward on me so that it's attacking my inner cat or can I bring it to bear in situations in the outer world where I need to be protective of myself, for example, you know, is there you know where where is aggression in the marriage if he needs to i mean he says they're they've been through a lot and they've kind of come through but you know a, a part of a marriage working well is that both people can sort of uh assert themselves and say this doesn't work for me 
I need more of this, you know? So I, I don't have any reason to believe in particular that any of that is going on in his marriage, but uh, those are some things I might explore. So another um, path into the dream could be just the feeling of horror mm -hmm. and just resting into that and asking the dreamer to just track the horror that he has felt in the course of his life. Mm -hmm. um, secondary to the symbols in the dream, as you had said, it may very well have been that his inner cat and his inner dog have been in a great clash, which can say something about the relationship between his inner masculine and his inner feminine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to have a disfigured cat that you now are nursing mm -hmm. inside? Often, um, the feeling of horror that we have can also make it very difficult for us to be in relationship to some inner part. Mm -hmm. it, because when we say we're horrified, we're overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. It's so inconceivable, so grotesque, so unexpected, that we're in a, some kind of a state of shock. And yet, he has discovered that there is an inner feminine instinct that has been disfigured. It's interesting that it says disfigured rather than, let's say, injured. Because mm -hmm. disfigurement is particularly related to how something looks. Being injured connotes that you know there's something now wrong with the functioning. Mm -hmm. So the dog and the cat interact with each other and this feminine instinct looks horrible, looks disfigured, grotesque. And so what does one do at that point? And I wonder what, what he will do now that he is aware that the feminine inside of him has been disfigured or is harder to love or not as pretty, perhaps, as he might have thought it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's like a scrappy alley cat. Like a scrappy alley cat with a maybe one eyed and with a, one of the ears really torn up. What do you make of the dog biting the cat's face of all the places that it might bite it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I like what you were saying about, you know, it, it changes how something appears. I mean, obviously that, mm -hmm. you know, in real life, that would be a terrible injury that could endanger, you know, eyesight, um, the ability to, you know, depending on where it is, the ability to eat, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it would be a serious injury. Um, but it, it also, uh, you know, there's some, there's something about, um, sort of, uh, it's it wouldn't likely be fatal. It's not like the dog went for the juggler. Mm -hmm. And the dog also just holds on, you know. It just does that that reminded me a little bit of um the the uh the, the Norse god of war Tyre. And he uh they they they're trying to trick um I think his name is uh and Joseph you can help me out. But they're trying to trick, is it Fenrir, the wolf? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah to so bind I, him yeah. because, you know, he's he's going to be um I'll have to I'll have to double check the, the, the name, but this is the wolf that's going to, you know, be bring about Ragnarok. So they have to bind him and they want to bind him with this magic cord. But he smells the trick and he says, Okay, I'll let you do it if one of you will put your hand in my mouth. 
And so um, the the god of war Tyre agrees to do it, and Fenrir bites off his hand. You know, but there's there's this sense of um, you know uh, the the kind of unrelenting quality of it. You know that that the dog is going to bite the face and and not let go. Um, I'm thinking of um, seeing dogs attack small animals and. They normally do is grab them and they shake them violently, mm-hmm. which often injures the spine. So it's unusual to uh, to have the dog just standing there holding the cat's face and then just releasing it. That that would be an unusual thing mm-hmm. to behold. Mm-hmm. Which which does make it seem more like some strange unconscious ritual process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So, so when the feminine goes into the mouth of the masculine and then returns, it is disfigured. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to consider here. So we hope we've given the dreamer some ideas. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.